So it's really my honor to introduce uh, Marty Hurst. Uh, Marty is a professor uh, in the School of Information and Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at Berkeley. Her primary interests are, research interests are user interfaces for search <coughs> engines, information visualization, natural language processing, and improving MOOCs. Uh, she received all of her degrees from this school up north uh, at Berkeley. Uh, and, uh, and I think only for a couple of years after you graduated, she was uh, on staff at Xerox Park uh, and then returned to uh, Berkeley. Uh, and, uh, and so she's, uh, she's sort of well known. She has many, many honors. I could spend a huge amount of time uh, going through the honors. Uh, I'll just mention two. She's, she's an ACM fellow. Uh, and she was recently elected to the Chi Academy. Uh, she's currently president of the Association <coughs> of, for Computational Linguistics. Uh, and uh, there's some less, lesser known things about Marty uh, that are able to find out. Uh, you might not know that she has an algorithm named after her. Uh, it's called the Hearst Patterns. Uh, that you might not know, uh, she has a, a photo in her office of her and President Obama. Uh, you might not know uh, that she played the, uh, the flute and the saxophone in an orchestra when she was a junior faculty member uh, at Berkeley. Uh, and, uh, and she's certainly someone who I think very early on, very much before many people did, sensed the importance of big data and searching for that and natural language interfaces. And all the things that we sort of see that have really changed, you know, the way we interact and communicate with each other uh, today. I mean, Marty was one of the persons that seemed to have a nose for that very early on. Uh, and I've always been impressed by this. She wrote the, uh, the first book on interfaces for search. Uh, and uh, and she, uh, she's going to today talk about the intersection of language, algorithms, and design. So, Marty Hurst. Well, thank you. That was a very overly kind introduction, Jim, and thanks for bringing me here to San Diego, one of my favorite places. Uh, it's wonderful to see my friends like Scott in the audience, who is also at Berkeley with me uh, before he came here. And uh, I will say I was not in an orchestra. I was in the pit orchestra of a musical put on by colleagues, uh, Dan Jarafsky and then Armando Fox. So that's made it sound a little more musical than I am, which I am really not. Uh, <laughs> So yes, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here with, with all my friends. And uh, I, I noticed, I, I actually was one of the first speakers in this, in this seminar. Scott invited me when uh, we were working in MOOCs and so on. And it was you know, design at scale, design at large. And so I talked about teaching at scale. Uh, because I, I don't, it's not on the website, I think it was before you all were recording these. So I'm not going to talk about that subject since I did that, although it was like five years ago. And I noticed, I went on the website and saw the recent speakers you've been having, and, and there's a common theme among a lot of them, which is this question about algorithms and the fact that people are questioning algorithms and how we design them. And so I thought I would take that as the organizing theme around my talk. And since it's Halloween, I also thought it'd be great to have a digital skull. So happy Halloween, everyone. Uh, and this is a little digital pirate skull, which comes from this excellent book, actually, by Kathy O'Neill called Weapons of Math Destruction. How many of you have heard her speak or seen her book? Just a few of you. Oh, gosh, it's, she, it's really impressive. She's a mathematician who had a very interesting life trajectory. She got a PhD in math. Then she went into industry and uh, hedge funds. And then she got disillusioned after the crash from that and started doing things to investigate the hedge funds and, uh, and so on and so forth. And then wrote this book with this wonderful title. And I really admire this because she does a great job of showing the nuances between what distinguishes helpful and harmful algorithms. And she, she does a lot of great things in this book. I'm not going to give the whole talk on her book, but I, I will talk a little bit about it. And so she has these kind of slogans, or if you will, about what's, what can be problematic about algorithms. She talks a lot about how they can affect the most, uh, the poorest, or the most, th those people with the least resources. And some of the problems uh, with 
what she calls WMDs. Uh, are, they measure what they can, not what they should. And I think uh, we're often guilty of this when we make algorithms in computer science. One of my examples is from search interfaces is in the early days especially, we would make an inter interface that would allow you to sort items by the uh, the file extension, like how many had PowerPoint and how many had .doc, like anybody wants to see that. It's just because it was easy to do. And that is uh, going to be a theme of my talk. Uh, another problem with WMDs is that they do not adjust agilely to error. And I'm going to give an example of this. They're not answerable to people. There's like often hidden behind a secret formula, uh, the secret sauce of the company. And most insidious of all, they create their own reality simply by existing. So I'm going to give an example of a good algorithm and a bad algorithm from her book. So a good model or a good algorithm she gives are, are baseball statistics, like your money ball out there. And the reason this is a good algorithm is, first of all, the stats are all there. They're transparent. Everybody can see the same stats and works from the same stats. And they reflect the reality of the baseball game. So they, they actually, when you model the, the statistics, you know, the home runs, the hits, and so on, that's actually what people care about for you know, whether or not people are going to win the game. So they, they actually can help determine whether or not the game is going to win, or whether or not a team is going to win the game, and, and so on. Uh, and there's more to it, more nuance to it that I'm going to go into. Uh, a WMD, uh, she has a very compelling chapter on this, uh, the US News and World Report College Rankings. But the history of this that she relates, I did not know. Uh, so she says they were, it was uh, just this second rate publication when it came out, it was called US News at the time. And it came out in 1988 and they decided, let's rank some colleges. It wasn't a common thing to do at that time. and. Well, they had to come up with some features to measure, and they just made up some features to measure, some things they could measure. Um, but more insidiously, uh, say they if they put something in like how expensive the college was, then certain colleges did not come out on top. Harvard, Stanford, so on. So they, they didn't put those features in the model. Uh, and, uh, so, and, they, and, and then if it had just stayed like a little local measure, then it probably wouldn't have mattered that much, but somehow it became really popular and it became the standard measure for all students for all colleges. So before you knew it, all college presidents were having to optimize their university to meet this model and all students and all parents were trying to optimize their students to go to those top ranked colleges. Uh, and therefore college presidents had to maximize everything in their campuses, the faculty student ratio, the low admissions rate, uh, how good the dining hall was, while not keeping costs low because the cost of the college was not one of the factors in the model. Uh, and this, this creates its own reality. Uh, furthermore, this has really invidious other effects like um, Students used to have a safety school that they would just apply to that they could be sure of getting in, but because there's a factor about the acceptance rate being low, ma making this, the school higher, then the school stopped wanting to accept the safety students to their schools, so then students were not getting into any college, and so on and so forth. And she has a statistic that between 85 and 2013, I remind you this, it was first introduced in 88, this ranking, uh, the cost of tuitions increased 500%. So uh, there's, there's a, a case to potentially be made that uh, this is a direct effect of this, although it may have been from other reasons. Uh, so, okay, that was really heavy. Uh, so uh, time for some humor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let's think about things that never work, but everyone does anyway. And this is another theme of my talk. So sometimes everybody does something because everybody else does. So one of them is, uh, promising yourself that you're going to get up, go to bed early tonight, all right? Um, trying to win over trolls in social media, you know it'll ever work, but you do it anyway. And here's another one, create these to explain something. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here that is. What is this? What is it? Okay, what is it telling you? Anyone, anyone, anyone? What is this? Someone tell me. What is it? It's supposed to represent the Words in yeah, but no, what is it? If you got it in your email, what is this advertising to you? Is anyone, can anyone guess? What is it? Keep guessing until somebody gets it right. Information visualization? No, no, what is the content? Genetics, biology, words. What do you think? So we got this in our, one of my colleagues got this in their email advertising something. 
Biology. Yeah, it was advertising a class. Do you, would you take this class? <laughs> What's it about? So this is kind of my point. Uh, so in the realm of language and text analysis, how often do we have the designs we want versus the, oh, those our algorithms can easily make? And I would say uh, sometimes we don't, like maybe a lot of the time. And so I don't think that these text problems are as bad as the WMDs that Kathy O'Neill talks about, but I think they're a problem, especially in today's era of misinformation. And it's not because people are trying to misinform in these cases, but I'll, I'll go into my thesis as, as we go. So first, a little history. In 2006, these things came out. They were called tag clouds. And I was puzzled. I was like, look at that. Um, so they came, they came around because, for those of you who don't remember, because you weren't around then, uh, pe people took photos and they put them on a site called Flickr and they put tags on them, which are, this is what the photo's about because a photo doesn't have words on it, so it'd be easier to look up the photos. And so you'd say this is a photo of a wedding and you put a <coughs> wedding tag on it and then this thing came along to show what the photos were about and it was stuck on, on Flickr, and, and Flickr doesn't even exist anymore. Well, I guess it does exist again. And so I was like, what? This violates so many perceptual principles. It looks like a paragraph, but it doesn't read like a paragraph. There's words are different sizes, which makes your eye dart all around. It's, it's sort of ugly. You know, if there's a big, long word, that makes it take up more space than a short word. But that doesn't, you know, so a city with a long name takes up more space than a city with a short name. That doesn't make any sense. On the other hand, it is compact, it's kind of eye-catching, and, and so on. It's actually in alphabetical order, and, uh, I don't know if you noticed that, and so on. But still, you know, why do they look like this? Uh, some people noted it kind of looks like a ransom note. Um, <laughs> so, uh, or some people thought maybe the computer's broken and they were refreshing their browser at first when they came out, like did the screen not load right? So I did an investigation. I actually was invited at Foo Camp um, before O'Reilly banned me for something I said once. But I was invited to Foo Camp, and I did 20 interviews. These were the leaders of the Web 2.0 movement. And I interviewed them. These are the people that invented places, things like Flickr, and then some other people as well later on. And there was a surprise. They didn't know what order the tag clouds were in. So people did not know they were in alphabetical order. And when I asked people, what order are the tags shown in, they would say things like, well, that's not really relevant. You know, that's not how I think about them. Um, I think they're in random order. Or they're ordered by semantic similarity. And actually, this was found in a follow-up study as well. People actually don't care about the order of tag clouds. On the other hand, people are saying, oh, they're used for navigation. Alphabetical order is useful when they kind of intellectualize it. So if the people that are commissioning them, obviously the person who coded it knew it for the company, but it was the person who had it commissioned to have it coded did not know. So what were these things for? And I have like a whole paper on this, but I'm going to make a long story very short. Uh, the main reasons for people putting these things on their site, and I also did a lot, we did a study of the, um, a bunch of people, what they wrote about them online <coughs> as well, um, were to signal the presence of the tags on the site. So they were a tag, indicator like, hey, we have social stuff on this site. An inviting way to get people interacting with the site, like this site is something you want to engage with. A good way to get the gist of the site. So that's what I'm also told. This is like what this is about. You can get the gist of what this is about. That's a claim that's made. And easy to implement. And I put that in a bigger font on purpose. <laughs> people said, oh yeah, it's easy to code in HTML. Really easy to code. And I think that's probably one of the most important things. So the new, my new perspective and the kind of the summary of the paper was tag clouds are social. They're not about information. They're not about navigation, even though some people claim that. They're really about signaling that there's tags and sort of signaling generally what this is about. This is about pets. It's not about computers, but that's about it. It's a way to reflect oneself, like these are my tags. Are they different than your tags? And I also asked people, you know, is this a, is this a fad uh, or not? Or I looked and then we also coded to see if people were saying it was a fad. A lot of people were saying this is a fad, it's probably going to die. Uh, but people weren't sure. 
All right, 10 years later, <laughs> they are not gone. Um, and data science is now hot. Although on Google Trends, uh, machine learning and AI seem to be passing big data and data science. <laughs> but um, it's, if you search on data science, you get some tag clouds as well as a lot of other visualizations. And if you search on word clouds, <laughs> there's a lot of word clouds. There are a lot of ways of making word clouds. Lots and lots of choices. Now, why is this? Well, primarily, and there's a big survey paper that shows this, People use them to have fun. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with people making art and having fun, in my opinion. That's fine. Uh, and it's become pretty easy to just paste some text online and, and make some. And that's, that's fine. However, people are also using them for, very commonly, for scientific discourse, uh, even though they don't work for that, I would claim. And the question is, why? OK, so this is a picture of a Wordle, which is uh, the first this sort of launched 1,000 tag cloud algorithms uh, by Feinberg. And this one you know, was the first really graphically kind of appealing one, I would say, unlike the ones I showed you before. Uh, and so when you look at this, there's some really big words that stand out and some smaller ones. But you know, you're probably pretty hard pressed to notice the small ones. And so whenever I see these, I always wonder, you know, what's the point of the small words? Like, why are they there? Unless you're really bored and you're on the subway across from somebody wearing this on a t-shirt, are you ever going to look at the small words? Um, so what are their, you know, their relative sizes really going to show you anything scientifically? What are the themes among the words? Can you tell? You know, how many words are about each topic? It's really hard to see that. And people say, oh, the sizes tell you the amount. Um, if you look at this, can somebody tell me the relative different sizes between redskins and Bengals and Bengals and cowboys and Seahawks? Uh, when you actually plot them in a bar chart, I think it's a lot different than whatever your intuitions were, probably, right? So I think whatever you thought, it wasn't that. All right. And then people say they're good for summaries, so I'm going to give you a few seconds to tell me. I'm going to show you a word cloud. Don't shout out the answer if you think you know. Just see if you can see what it's a summary of. <coughs> All right, now that's the answer. <laughs> How many of you recognize that? One. Why did you not see that? <laughs> Well, the word clouds remove stop words, typically, you know, the, the syntactic units. So to, be, not, or, those are all removed. Uh, they would have been pretty large, potentially, if they weren't removed. And then you see sleep and bear and death. Our word association engines are making us think about bears hibernating or maybe killing you, right? Those words are in there. If you look somewhere in there, it's not what they're, it's not what it's about. It's dreams and death and shuffling off this mortal coil. It's what happens when you take words out of their sentences where they belong. And when people communicate, they're not thinking about the individual words. They're thinking about the concepts that fall, that arise off of those words. But when we do data analysis, we obsess about the actual words used which isn't the point most of the time. But that's what we do. We throw them into our NLP analysis thing and we see what word is most common because that's the easiest thing to compute and plot. So Feinberg, who invented the Wordle, is a very thoughtful guy from his writing. I actually don't know him personally. And he knew what he was doing. And you know, millions of people, he wrote this paper after millions of people had started uh, using Wordles. So, he worked at IBM before he made Wordles, doing uh, this dog ear system that you, was building on tags. And he said something like this. Some of Wordles' success is due to its one pace, one click, instant gratification. And he, he was very early with having something where you could just take some text, copy, and paste it in. And it did the TF-IDF calculation. It did the, the tokenization. It did everything. You just got a thing up there. And then you could automatically just refresh and get new fonts, new layouts, new colors, and it looked awesome. There's not, this is all quotes from Feinberg. There's not much evidence that tag clouds 
are all that useful for navigation or other interactive tasks. Once I decided to build a system for viewing text rather than tags, it seemed superfluous to have the words do anything other than merely exist on the page. I decided I would design something primarily for pleasure. So his goal was not to make something for scientific analysis. He knew he was making something for fun and art. The commonly used trick of scaling by the square root of the word's weight to compensate for the fact that words have area, not just length, simply makes a wordle look boring. So those of us who teach InfoViz, one of the things we teach is if you use, say, a circle instead of a line, the area is seen in two dimensions. And so you have to actually take the square root of the area or else people see it twice as large as the actual value. He is aware of this. But he didn't want to reduce the size to course of the words to correspond to the relative size of the underlying number because it made the word all look boring. Color means absolutely nothing in Wordle. It is used for contrast and aesthetics. Okay, so Wordles are not for doing anything scientific, according to their inventor. All right. So other studies were done, a different, uh, this big interview with study was done with, with Martin Wattenberg and Fernando Villegas a, a year later, where they surveyed 4,306 Wordle users, because there's a lot of users and they like Wordle and they answered the survey. And they found 50% did not understand what the font size meant. 57% wrote, wrote the text themselves, so they were not using it on data. And color, they often was interpreted as having meaning, they didn't have a precise number. So People did not understand what was going on at all with these things. And there's other studies that have been done on various variations of word clouds have been found that varying font size is detrimental to understanding statistics. Font size can guide visual search for certain tasks, but users prefer to just type in a search box if they actually have to look, <coughs> actually have to look up words. And if you use like column layouts or bar charts, these are much better if you actually care about frequencies. So, this is a, you know, so fine. So why are they used in general by everyday people? They're easy to make, they're visually engaging, and other people use them. So they're commonly used. So, so that's cool. And you know, if these were just an art project, uh, I wouldn't really have any beef to make. But I do have a beef because they continue to be used as evidence in scientific settings. Uh, last spring, uh, this was used in a PhD student's qualifying exam that I intended, attended and in a faculty applicant's written materials and job talk that uh, crossed our portal. Um, needless to say, that person was not hired. Uh, so, and people just seem really unaware of like, why they're using these things. They put them up and you're supposed to interpret them. Uh, also, I just got back from Berlin where I was at the InfoViz conference and there were at least two papers with them. This was in one paper, and the person's, in the, in the text of the paper, it stated that this word cloud shows a summary of tweets, and it was dynamically updating all of the time. So in some manner, that is a summary. So maybe it is. I, I could imagine a better summary. Um, this one was shown, and the, here's the quote from the paper. We see this distribution covers a variety of ethnic surnames, perhaps giving insight into how immigrants migrated after coming to Ellis Island. Perhaps. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I asked the author why they use this design. There was also a map. Um, so the idea is there's actually a cool project where they are able to find how do surnames co-occur with some geographic data. And then they have a map where they show the surname in this case is um, Rossi, and these are other surnames that co-occur with Rossi. But, uh, and on the map, they sort of show where it occurs. And, and he said, well, my undergrads did this, and they did it because other people do word clouds. And it's the spiral layout because that's what Wordle uses. And so that's why this, the large ones are far from the other ones and so on. So this is kind of my point, is people do it because other people do it, and because people aren't complaining. And so I figured it's time to complain. <laughs> But furthermore, I mean, they're trying to go beyond that to say something about insight about migration, and, and I just think there's probably better ways to do that. And my final example, uh, this was presented at the 
ACL Conference Associate for, Association for Computational Linguistics. Uh, and this was shown for 28 seconds. So accepted paper titles from one year versus the, the previous year. So here we find differences among the words in large letters. We find, for example, learning networks and embeddings being heavily represented in ACL 2018 titles. Well, pairs of bigrams are not shown together here, so we can't see learning networks. But I'm wondering if you can see the difference between 2018 and 2017. And can you see the small words? Which words are different and by how much? And I've given you way more than 28 seconds, so <laughs> get to work. <laughs> All right, so we wouldn't plot numerical axes incorrectly. So I'm just wondering, why is it OK to show text in this way? Don't feel bad if you've done it, because everybody does it. Um, so, so why are these used in science? I talked about why they're used by lay people. And my answer is, you know, nature abhors a, a text analysis vacuum. Uh, it's because there isn't some alternative. And so when I've talked about this in the past, people have said, well, give me an algorithm then. But now I feel I don't have to have an answer to that because we are more aware of the problems with algorithms that are not serving us properly. So I feel like I can go back into my nagging mode that I've been in the past, but I stopped because I was a wet blanket. But now it's fashionable to be a wet blanket again. Um, training and usability is generally lacking in the sciences. And also, specific to text, there's some issues. So as those of us in cognitive science know, almost, and I'm not really in cognitive science, but almost any text outcome can look OK, because people are great at making up associations among words. So I went to this website called randomlist.com, and I typed in three, and I got that. Surely you can make up something about popcorn reach and screw. Some, there must be some concept that ties these three words together. Can somebody make up something, a machine that helps, uh, helps you fix a popcorn popping machine without having to reach really far? I don't know, right? I mean, you can always find an association among words and make a category out of it. And we know from information retrieval research, it's very hard to conjure something that isn't there in a text collection. So whenever we do a search study and we ask people, have you found everything? People say yes, unless they're a real expert in an area, then they're concerned, they feel like they haven't found things. But people are really bad at not knowing what they haven't found, especially in text. Or maybe they're bad in everything, but text is the area I know. And it's, if you have, say, a bunch of categories and there is a missing category, if, or a, a bunch of automatically generated text groupings. People are really bad at not knowing what's, knowing what's not there. Okay, so let's return to this example. What are some alternatives? Well, those of us who teach viz can pretty easily come up with some. So here's one. This is sometimes called a, a dot plot. I don't know, there's different names. What I did was I just said, okay, what's the difference in frequency between, I actually got the titles and processed them myself. And it turns out actually neural is the most common word in the titles, it's not a stop word, and it doesn't actually appear in these word clouds. Why, does anyone have a guess why? Yes? It was so far away from the other numbers in terms of quantity. Yeah. Is it just truncated? More what would have happened if they'd put it in the word cloud? It would, it would have been huge and would have swamped out the other words. Another problem with the word cloud. So they must have deleted it because it would have swamped out. You wouldn't have been able to see any of the other words if they'd put neural in because it would have been relatively so much larger than the other ones. All right. So that's by far bigger than the others. And it also has the biggest difference in size. So the yellow dot is the count from, of the number of words from 2017, and the purple is from 2018. Then learning, those were two, those were pretty. So here I have the frequency on the top is the number of titles that the word occurs in. And then, um, the difference is the difference between the two years, and I have them in sorted order by the frequency of the word in 2018. And so as we go down, I guess I can use my pointer, um, we see different, um, yeah, different, uh, what about learning? It's not in the 2017 word count. 
Word cloud. Oh, uh, it's not in the word cloud? Maybe it is, but you can't see it. It's no, big. It's oh, it's big. big. Yeah. It's big in 2018. Uh, where is it in mine? I, mean, I don't have it. Top, top, top. Oh, it's there. Yeah. No. Oh, oh, the difference. Yeah. Oh, you probably just can't see it because it's in a hard to see color or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, but the problem with this is that it's in a certain order. It's not in the order of the difference. So we could instead sort it by the, the difference. So here I just said, okay, which ones have the biggest difference? So 2018 minus 2017. And here we can see, okay, neural had the biggest difference, then automatic, document, entity, language, et cetera. So if you cared about that, you could do that. And then, but here's something interesting. If I get down to the bottom, and here I have a negative is the ones that were, these are the biggest in 2017. Look at that. I, I have the middle cut out because it doesn't fit. Sort of a uh, not symmetric. What does that suggest? More papers in 2018. So it's not even a normalized comparison. Mm -hmm. Which I didn't even realize until I plotted it like this. So you, you actually, you know, you need to plot data multiple ways to actually even see what's going on. But if, if people aren't really understanding that, the, I don't want to, want to have like bring up a thing and scroll it online here. But there's more, um, diff there's more um, bigger differences in the 2018 direction and the 2017 direction. And I suspect that's because there were just more papers, because there were more words in the 2018 direction. But it wasn't normalized because we get more submissions every year and we keep accepting 25% of the papers, that means there's gonna be more words in 2018. But that wasn't taken into account, it wasn't normalized. So, um, now the problem with what I was showing is it doesn't emphasize the words as much, so we could just zoom in and, and try to make it clearer which were the words that were the biggest uh, differences and make a sort of more focused thing like this. But I will admit, that something that is lacking from this design is a focus on the words themselves. So something that Word Clouds does give you is it really makes you notice the big words. So that is an advantage of those Word Clouds. You don't notice the small words, maybe you might notice one or two for some random reason, but you don't, but you, you really do see those big ones and you don't so much with the bar charts. And so, uh, here is an approximate alternative. Since I did it by hand, um, I didn't like make the numbers right. So here's an alternative where I've grouped words together according to categories. If you know about computational linguistics at least, these are into general categories that are related like semantics, deep learning and neural nets, parsing and language models, um, machine learning, and so on. And let's just pretend that I have the relative sizes right, even though I just made them up here, because it was too much work to uh, automate this, because I don't have a program to do it yet. Uh, is this better? It's organized by topics. If I were to show this in a keynote and say, uh, these were the difference in size in the general areas, would this be more informative than what was shown in the word cloud? I'm going to argue yes. <laughs> and I have some empirical data to point to back it up. And this is the, if you can't beat them, join them solution. <laughs> so if the bar charts just aren't going to work, this is an alternative word cloud. Yes? What about phrases like machine learning? Ah, phrases can be much better. And the, there is a, it is a hard problem in NLP about where exactly to cut them off. But if you yeah, hand engineer them, it can be much better. And actually, word clouds often look a lot better if you use uh, bigrams and so on. Yeah, good point. All right. So here's some new work where the goal is to retain the engaging aspect of word clouds, since if you can't beat them, join them, while imparting some useful semantic information. And, but, but by the way, getting rid of the assumption that size means anything, because people really do not process the size of these things in any depth, except for really big ones get noticed. So the hypothesis was organizing the words uh, both semantically and visually, will improve the understanding of these things while retaining engagement. So a big question is how do you evaluate these things? Because if you say what the category is supposed to be, then you've already said what the category is. If you say look up a word and the word's there, 
that's defeating the purpose. So one of our contributions was coming up with a way to evaluate these things. So most research papers about word clouds are sort of vague about what their goal is. They say gist or summary or navigate or see trends. But then when they evaluate them, they have the participants identify the largest word or identify a word or something like that. So how do we evaluate these more deeply? So we came up with a new task or somewhat new task. Somebody had sort of done something like this. Given a set of words, identify the category, but it's like the game, how many of you played the game Taboo? You know that game? It's like that game. So here's some words where the category cannot be one of these words, but it needs to encompass all of the words. So what's the category? Restaurants. Right. So we came up with a set of 60 categories like this that native English speakers in the US would get right 95% of the time on Mechanical Turk. So they're pre-tested. When we give them, you gotta have all the words, because often the words are really ambiguous. So if you only have three of the words, you might not get it right. But if you've got all five of the words, you can guess the category. And we pre-tested them. Then we uh, put, uh, do another study where we train the participants. We say, okay, we're gonna show you these things like this. And say there's two categories in this image type the two categories here. We first show them just the one category like I showed you, then we show them like two. In this case, we're training them and saying, the colors, look everybody, the color corresponds to the category. We're actually gonna give you that hint. So this makes the word clouds work better because we're actually giving them the giant hit, which they don't normally have. Uh, notice that the categories are color coded and we have them practice and then we have them practice with fives. <coughs> so here's where we have five categories and 25 words and they gotta guess, okay? That's the name of the game. Everybody with me? Guess the taboo category. So this way, this is kind of like what you see is people pull words out of a document or a collection and they put them in a word cloud and they say, oh, this summarizes the document. We're really trying to simulate that. What are the five latent categories in this document? But we can really test it. But they're very distinct categories. In real documents, it's their, they overlap and bleed a lot more than in our artificial setup. Okay. And then we have a bunch of comparisons, I'm not gonna do them all, but here's one of them. Uh, was there a question? No. Uh, where we compared, oh yeah, so in our, one of our hypotheses is white space is better than not between the categories. So we try to make it more fun than boring columns, so we put a little bit of font variation. We also did it with no font variation earlier. Uh, we compare this, this is a Wordle a word cloud but where we color coded the colors, we like, guess what? The colors all correspond to the category. And this is just black and white. Um, in normal wordles, the colors are random. We, instead of making them random, we just did black and white because we had an earlier black and white test. And our hypothesis is the this is the worst, this is second best, and this is best, and that people would prefer these because they're more fun than those. Uh, it turned out that, yes, these were abysmal, uh, Wordles are just terrible for finding categories. In the time limited, we gave them 15 seconds. And people were very good. Some people would get five out of five uh, for the columns and in between for the color-coded Wordles. Um, and when we asked which did you prefer the, for the task, 88% preferred the uh, columns. They, they did not prefer the Wordle. And you've got to remember, these were crowd workers, uh, Mechanical Turks, so since they are judged on how well they do, it's kind of natural they would prefer the thing that helps them do the task best. So in the next study we asked which do they prefer for the task and which do they prefer aesthetically. We separated that. So the next, ta the next task, we have the columns as before but with bigger font variation like what Wordle does uh, just to make it harder and then um, we have the regular Wordle and then we um, found this website that kind of lets you keep the categories together but makes it look like a Wordle so all the all the pinks are together, all the browns are together, all the greens are together but there are categories. So we thought people would like these the best and we thought this would do the best, second best, third best and that's pretty much what happened. I kind of tried to code it down here, it's hard to see but um, so the um, color Wordle now is, is doing better than the black and white Wordle. Uh, it's much less good than the other two, but these two are statistically tied. So uh, once you start, you don't really need the white space once you keep the colors close together. And so, so that was a bit of a surprise and encouraging because that means we can really make it look Wordle-ish and as long as we keep the categories separate. 
So that was exciting. And then 90% still preferred the column, uh, but it was, uh, and 50% aesthetically preferred the column, but the other rest was split between these two. But we think there's a confound because we made the fonts so varied. We think if the fonts were uniform, they would have, more of them would have preferred this, just the columns. Okay, coming back to this, as I said, we received this in our, one of our, my colleagues received this in our email. So we decided to do a separate thing, which is to get more at the aesthetics. Uh, and so rather than have people try to guess these categories, we thought, let's take this design, uh, reduce some of the words, and make four variations of it, and have people just tell us which one they like the best, not do a task. But we still did it on Turk, so these are still people that do try to get work done. And we said, imagine this was put uh, on the t top of a web page for a course that you were thinking about taking. Uh, which of the following do you prefer? So here's the four designs, A, B, C, and D. So you guys can see that uh, this is a simplified version of what I was showing you before. This is that one where they are grouped close together, but kind of in a wordle. This is one where we kind of sort of put it in a radial layout, and this is the column layout. So let's take a poll. How many people prefer this one? How many, if this is for looking like at a, a web page for a course, okay. How many people prefer this? How many people prefer this? And how many people prefer this? Okay, so that's kind of similar to what we found. We actually had them rank them, give, give them a Likert scale, and then say why, and these were this one was a little bit preferred over that, and people hated, hated that, and gave some merit to that. And then we had some comments, and people said, when they said that they liked this, it was like, if I'm only going for like artsy aesthetics, uh, then I would kind of like that, but yeah. So, key findings of this study, visually grouped layouts compared to ungrouped layouts are more effective in time constrained category understanding tasks when th there's some meaning to these categories. Visual grouping can be achieved by separating categories via white space or color or both. And for analytical tasks, layouts with white space tends to be preferred over spatially arranged groupings, at least for these mechanical Turk workers. And these results hold for semantically distinct categories. We haven't looked at other kinds of categories. And, you know, so the question is, why isn't this done now? I don't think this is like earth shattering. This, the point is, this is what cognitive science would predict. But these things have been around for more than 10 years, and yet they're not being used this way. So that, to me, is the question. I felt I had to do these careful studies to prove something that to me was super obvious. Uh, so why isn't this done now? Well, it's not easy to make the word clouds this way because it's not easy to separate the categories. There were also some biases around word clouds about there has to be, they have to be crammed together, there can't be any white space. There are some people that have said, oh, maybe we should do this, but it hasn't caught on. But in general, it's not easy to make language algorithms work well. And yeah, so bottom line is, we got to make something that's easy to use, that automatically figures out the categories, or that really pushes people to manipulate their text to make the categories. But when there are easy tools that do something that isn't right, then you know they create their own reality. You know, as Kathy O'Neill says, algorithms create their own reality, and this is what I believe happens with cheap and easy text analysis algorithms: is that you get information that's misleading, and you know, it's just, people feel it's harmless. People are like, why do you care about this? And I think now we have a framework for understanding why I care about this, is that um, these things create their own reality. And that reality isn't necessarily reflecting what texts are talking about. I mean, people make these sites like, what are people talking about on Twitter? Let's look at frequent words. Or what are we talking about in our email? Let's look at frequent words. Um, but pulling out popular words is often misleading. It, it often reflects the concepts for which there are not other words. So a favorite example I have of mine is when people were doing this stuff with Twitter and they're putting frequent words and somebody asked, they were giving a talk and they made it, had a pie chart or something about what was most talked about. And 
And I'm like, oh, I think there's probably something missing there. And they're like, what? And I'm like, well, food. Because people are taking pictures of their food, and there's all these different words for food. And so your most frequent category, your most frequent word thing isn't going to catch that because there's lots of different foods. And the person like threw a, a little Snickers at me. He's like, you win the prize, yes. And I'm like, well, it's obvious if you think about this sort of thing. And the same thing with search results. Uh, you know, like when the search engines first came out and people were like, oh, people are only searching for porn. And I'm like, no, that's because there's only like three ways to search for porn. But you know, <laughs> lots of people are searching for history, but there's many, many, many different ways to search for history. It's when there's multiple ways to say the same thing, then the most popular word doesn't come up. It's the category history. I mean, with Twitter hashtags, that people have actually realized that, and that's how they actually try to decide, you know, indicate what everybody's talking about. So this can create a feedback loop. This is popular, therefore important, uh, but it often is not reflecting reality. And it's also a substitute for truly identifying the underlying meaning of words. As we saw with the Hamlet example, disembodied words do not necessarily reflect the underlying meaning. So. That's why I, boy, since I'm kind of low on time, I'm not going to do the, the next part of the talk. So how often do we have the designs we want versus those our algorithms can easily make? I think when you do use a text analysis algorithm, maybe you should think about that next time. And I think I'll just uh, open it up for questions. <laughs>